I'm going to postpone the deadline. For people who have turned it in already, if you think your solution is A-OK, -okay, everything is working just fine, then you can get extra credit if you don't turn it in again. On the other hand, if you think you turn in something that may not be 100% functional, then you get some extra time to finish it. <coughs> OK? Yep. Question. If it's not fully functional, but you turned it in on time, can mm -hmm. you still get extra credit if you don't change it? <laughs> <laughs> well, if, but you will still lose points because it is not uh, fully functional. So I, I would much rather, if you think it's not 100% functional, you know, to get it to become 100% functional. Okay. okay. So what I'll do, um, well, let me let me think about how much time, how much extra time you get based on uh, today's lecture, because you know I'm hoping that to hear from some of you about. Okay, you know, mine can work up to here, but for this particular case, it doesn't work. Okay, so I want to see where you are stuck at in order to gauge how much time, you know, extra time you will need to get this done. Okay, the idea is not to make you guys, you know, suffer. That might be the side effect of the homework <laughs> assignment, but that was not the, in, that's not the intended, you know, uh, effect of the assignment. The intended effect of the assignment is for you guys to fully understand what is the double precision or just any floating point representation. And the kind of trouble that your computer has to go through to convert from base 10 to base 2. Okay, so those are the things that I want to illustrate with this particular homework assignment. Okay, so what I'll do is I will you know, ask you guys for test cases that you find particularly tricky. Then we'll go over those test cases in class today. Okay, so I'll, I'm open right now. Okay, go ahead and give me you know, specific specific test cases. One point two five three e to the negative. One point two five three e to the negative. Actually, no, negative three. What's going to e to the negative three? Yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and start with this one. For those of you who who have specific test cases and somehow your program is not working or it comes up with a uh, representation that you that does not actually represent a value. You know, go ahead and write down those things, and we'll I will try to get to those as much as I can today. Yep. Double check that the audio and video. Program. I will do so in just a moment. All right. So the recorder is on, and it is recording this lecture at this point. <clears throat> all right. So I'm hoping you can all see this. Um, I can change the title here, and it becomes just uh, today's date. And this is automatically saved on the power server, I mean, uh, uh, the Boodle server. So there's no need for me to copy and paste at the end of the class. I just have to remember to click, oh, okay. Page content goes here. So I just have to remember to click save and display or save and return to course at the end of this class and everything is going to be saved. All right, so we're, we'll work with uh, this number first, 1.235253 e negative 3. So from the parsing stage, you will break it out into 1, 2, 5, 3, and the exponent is ne uh, negative 3. Um, these can be individual, individually taken out you know, from the parsing logic of your subroutine. Okay? So I'm hoping the parsing logic is not is all done you know, at this point, because you, know, you have to be able to extract you know, the 1 before the period. The two five three after the decimal point, and also the exponent. In this case, is it is a negative exponent in base ten. So, are there any questions about you know parsing the string itself to extract these components? Okay, so this, these components are all available. <coughs> so one thing, the first thing we are, the, the first thing I would do is to convert one two five three into an integer itself. Okay, now it can be an unsigned integer because you know, we are not going to deal with negative numbers. The sign of a floating point number is represented by a single bit. It is not in two's complement. 
So that's why we don't need to use you know, signed integers. In this case, we can you know, use, just use unsigned numbers. Okay. So what I'm going to do is to say oh, 1.253 uh, times 10 to the power of negative 3, okay, which is the value that I want to represent. Yes? Will we get any problems if we just use the signed integer? Um, it has to be a long, long, you know, so everything that we do in this class, when this particular um, assignment needs to be long, long, or 64-bit, because if you do a 32-bit integer and you shift it more than 32 times, you get zero, you know, regardless. So you do have to make sure that it is um, the 64-bit 64, 64 version of integer. Now, if you use signed integers, you lose basically one half of the number because that's just not useful. So I still recommend using unsigned integers whenever you know, possible. Um, the only problem is you know, when you do bit shifting with a signed number, you know, it can end up you know, replicating the signed bit itself. It's called signed extension. I don't think we'll encounter that case, but when we get to that point, I will kind of point out. Okay? All right. So. The, the, the value that we want to represent is this value here. But we have you know, the individual chunks here. So the first thing I want to do is to um, concatenate 1 and 253 into one single number. Because otherwise, I have the 1 being separate from 253, which makes it kind of hard to process. So <clears throat> the first thing I do is to combine 1, 253 into 1,253. But in order to do this successfully, I have to make an adjustment to the exponent in base 10, right? Because there, I have I'm already multiplying the number by 1,000, so I have to adjust, to adjust that by multiplying you know, 10 to the power of negative 6 in this case, so that the value that I'm representing is not changing. Is that OK? Does, there be, does everybody understand how I got from this one, which is kind of the <coughs> optimal way to represent the value that I want to represent to a form where everything is an integer. There are no um, floating point numbers or fixed point numbers in this case. There's no implicit decimal point. Okay, this is okay? All right. So the next thing I want to do is to look at this number and then ask myself, now how can I represent this particular value, which is the same thing as this particular value here, but my interest now is how do I represent it as a numerator divided by a denominator, okay? Because that's the starting point of the actual conversion process, okay? So in this case, I can now say, oh, the value that I want to represent, value, which is v, is really 1, 2, 5, 3 divided by 10 to the power of 6, right? Because 10 to the power of negative 6 is the same thing as 1 over 10 to the power of 6, which is no other no otherwise known as 1 million. Are we still doing OK so far? So at this point, I can now go back to the logic, or at least a part of the logic that we talked about in the previous class. Any questions about this part? Which consists of you know, the beginning or the prep part, consists of you know, shifting the numbers and compensate by using an exponent in base 2. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to say I have an implicit uh, exponent in base two. It is just two to the power of zero at this point. So I'm, I, I'm, I, I, I would use extra parentheses just so that we can clearly see uh, the fractional part and the exponent part. Is this still okay? Okay, because we have to keep track of the exponent uh, in base two as we make adjustments to the numerator and the denominator. Okay, all right. So we can do the following two things in uh, any specific order. It doesn't matter which way you do it because the first thing we want to do, or the first two things we want to do, is to make the numerator as big as possible, use up all 64 bits if we possibly can. And we want to make the denominator as small as possible but without losing track of its value. And we'll do all that by adjusting the exponent in base 2. So every time we multiply the numerator by 2, we will um, subtract 1 from the uh, exponent in base 2. Is that OK? All right. So I will start with uh, 
I'm going to use a spreadsheet here, so I'm, I'll cheat a little bit. <clears throat> so we'll start up a spreadsheet. Uh, that's under office. And I think a spreadsheet is really useful in terms of uh, programming. This is from my morning class, which I don't need anymore. That's from my CISP 360 class, which I don't need anymore. This is for this class, and at this point, I don't need this anymore either. Okay, and you can see how I use spreadsheets in all of my programming <coughs> classes because it really is just a very useful tool to visualize, you know, the steps of doing things because it, it can show you stepwise, you know, for each step I'm doing this, for each step I'm doing this, and so on. So I would start up a, a new uh, spreadsheet file. And I'll start with the number. 1252 is my um, numerator. Numerator. Okay, there we go. And here I would have you know, the exponent in base 2. Okay. And this is 0. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is to say, well, let's multiply this one by 2. And in order to do that, I have to subtract 1 from the exponent in base 2 so that I'm still representing the same value. So now I look at this number and say this one is this, which is the previous number or the one in the previous row, minus 1. And now we have an implicit uh, negative 1, uh, exponent of negative 1 in base 2. Are we doing OK so far at this point? Okay. So the nice thing about the spreadsheet is I can now drag this and drag this so I can visualize and say oh okay so if I multiply the numerator to become a number this large then I have to multiply uh, this number to a exponent of 2 that is negative 11 to make it up so that I'm still representing the same value it's just that I'm putting as many bits as possible to the numerator but I'm not done yet, okay? I'm not done yet because this number, which is 2 million something, is not using up 64 bits, okay? So I want to use all the way up to bit 63, which is the most significant bit, and that is why you don't want to use signed numbers, because when you use signed numbers, when you use bit 63, it means it's a negative number. So it doesn't represent a non-negative number anymore. So that's why I recommend the internal types of the entire subroutine to only make use of unsigned long long. Okay. All right. So I can keep doing this for a while. Okay. Um, and the condition is I want to do this until bit 63 is a 1. Okay. Now how do I know whether bit 63 is a 1 or not? I can uh, compare this to a particular value, right? Exactly, I can compare this to 2 to the power of 63. If it is greater than or equal to, then I have met the goal. I have met the objective. So <coughs> in this case, I'm going to say um, if, okay? And you can use if uh, in a spreadsheet. It's the same thing as a ternary operator in C and C++. So it has three components. The first one is a condition, and then you have the true value, and then you have the false value, just like a ternary operator. C and C++, as well as many other languages based on C and C++. So the first thing I'm going to do is to say, is this number uh, greater than or equal to, and then we use power. In this case, we have 2 to the power of 63, which is a pretty large number, and I'll leave it up to the spreadsheet to calculate it. Um, and if so, I am going to say done. If not, I'm going to say not done. So in this case, it only takes like strings as the. No, no, it can take else. anything. It can take another form. It can take thing. anything. It can take another ternary operator. Oh, so so it can have nested ternary operators in a spreadsheet style as a formula. It is very nice. It's very useful. Um, for those of you who kind of want to learn more about spreadsheets, it even has indirect. It's kind of like dereferencing. You can, you can use a calculation method to calculate uh, the row number and the column number. And then you can use quote unquote indirect to access the value at that particular cell. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. 
<coughs> and useful too. All right, so what I'll do is I'm going to cheat again a little bit and just let it do it. And so I'm not going to do it myself. And we should be getting, well, not even close. <laughs> we have some ways to go here. <coughs> there we go. Done. Okay. So this is the first row that we are done, and this is what we want. Okay. Um, it automatically switches to the scientific location because it is otherwise going to be a pretty big number. Okay. And I did not give it a lot of space, and that's why it switches to a scientific location here. But in your program, if you do something like this with a unsigned long long, it will be able to store that value exactly, which is what you want. Okay? What this spreadsheet is doing is illustrating a process where you can systematically do a left shift to the numerator until it hits bit 63, until bit 63 becomes a 1. We still doing okay so far. Now, you, what you can do with this one is you can do it with uh, a loop. Okay. All right. So this part is all done, and I will go ahead and erase the ones that I do not need. So I'm going to get rid of this part here. This is the value that I want. Okay. I have shifted as much as I can to the left <coughs> in order to use up all 63, 64 bits to represent the numerator. And then what I'll do next is to do the opposite to the denominator. I want to make the denominator as small as possible, but without, using, without losing any significant digits. In other words, I will shift all the zeros out, but as soon as I hit a 1, I'm going to stop and say, OK, cannot shift that one out. Okay. So the way to do it is to look at our number here. Okay, This is our denominator 10 to the power of 6 otherwise known as 1 million so um, there there's an easy way to do it but I'm not gonna you know do any shortcuts here so we'll start with a million 1 2 3 4 5 6 and this is the denominator denominator okay this is the uh, normal denominator and I want to make it as small as possible without um, losing a bit of 1 as the least significant digit um, and at this point, I'm going to copy this particular value because this is my starting point. Because I have to keep track of the compensation exponent of 2 from the previous one, okay? Because there it's continuous. So what I'll do is I'm going to ask the question, can I divide this number by 2 and not have any remainder? That's the question, right? So what do you think? Can I divide this number by 2 and have 0 as a remainder? Yeah, Obviously, right? OK. So I can use the same type of formula here. And I can say if um, taking the mod, mod is taking the remainder. So I'm going to say if this number, which is known as the dividend, <coughs> mod 2, if this is um, zero, or this is, if this is, well, either way it's fine. I can say if this is zero, then I'm not done. Okay, not done. And if it is non zero, then I am done. Okay, so I'm clearly not done here. So that means I should go move on to the next row. In the next row, which is the step, okay, this is corresponding to what you need to do per iteration in the loop, is to do something like this. Take this number. Divided by 2, because we know for sure that we're not going to lose anything because of this, right? <laughs> but I also have to remember to change the exponent. If I, if I divide the denominator by 2, how do I compensate with the exponent of 2 as a correction factor? Do I increase it by 1, or do I subtract it by 1? Increase it by 1. Okay, let's take a look. So we have some kind of a number, okay? And I am <coughs> saying the original number is 1 divided by x times 2 to the power of n. Okay? So if I change this x to 2x here, what do I need to do to n in order to make this value exactly the same as that value? Hmm? 
So it becomes n plus 1. Okay? So I need a plus 1 every time I shift. Yeah, but adding a factor. Right. But except in this case, I am having the denominator, which is going in the opposite direction. In other words, we're going in this direction for each step. So I'm actually subtracting 1 from the correction exponent of 2. Okay? So that means this number is going to be based on the previous number but I have to subtract one from it. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay. And this one, I can just copy it because, you know, the logic works for each row. So at this point, I can just say, okay, fine, go ahead and let it rip. <coughs> and in this case, you know, you can clearly see that it will only take six steps because 10 is 2 times 5, right? And 5 is not divisible by 2. So each time we multiply or each time we increase the exponent in base 10 by 1, we also have to shift it by 1 to get rid of that 1, 0 in base 2 that we don't really need. Are we still doing okay so far? So at this point, I have the numerator being as big as we it is possibly can, which is this number. We have the denominator being as little as possible, being this number. And then we have the correction factor just for that purpose. Okay? Are we still doing okay so far? Yep. If you were adding to the exponent, why is it increasing? I'm subtracting, not adding. Because I start off with a larger denominator. Oh, okay. I'm going to half the value. So I'm going in this direction, not that. Not yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I better double check everything first, okay? Now, how do I double check everything in this case? Well, it's not too bad, okay, because what we want to do is simply to divide the numerator by the denominator and then multiply the whole thing to 2 to the power of this number here and see if we still get back 1.253 times 10 to the power of negative 3, which is what it is supposed to be, and we still have it, okay? So this is a good ver verification to basically say that we have not lost the original value. We have changed you know, the, the form because now it is a numerator divided by a denominator times two to the power of something as a compensation factor. But we have not we have not lost the value, which is the important part. Are we still doing okay so far with this <coughs> stuff here? Okay. Alright. So the next step we're gonna do is to actually do the division. Okay, so we'll basically do the division, but only keep the integer part of the division. Because when in the spreadsheet, if I divide two numbers and it will give me a fractional number, it will actually give me the decimal point and everything else after that. So I have to do something to kind of cut off the fractional part. So I think, let's see. I think I can just do the int here, which takes only the integral part of a number. So I'm gonna take the integral part of the numerator divided by the denominator, and I end up with this number here, okay? And this number is just an integer. It is a really big integer, okay? But nonetheless, it is just an integer without the fractional part. The fractional part is gone, okay? So that is simply lost. Um, because we won't have enough actual digits to represent it anymore. So the next thing is we look at the big pattern that is representing 7.223 something something times 10 to the power of 14, which is a big, huge you know, value. And then we want to look at this number and say, OK, is this fitting the requirement of requiring uh, 53 bits to represent it? Now, why 53 bits? Because in the floating point number representation, remember, we have 52 digits allocated to the fraction of the mantisa. Because there's an implicit one point, which is you know, not represented in the actual number. So that makes 52 plus 1, which is 53 digits that we need in order to represent the value. So that's why this is important. Are we still doing OK so far with this stuff at, uh, up to this point? Does everybody understand why 53 bits is a magical number? Yep. Um, I don't know, but so 
what I found, like, um, what I found that was helpful is the mm -hmm. fact that um, for like scientific notation, how we, any scientific number we want to represent, it's going to be some number <coughs> that's like between the digits, basically like zero through nine of like base 10, mm -hmm. and then some fractional part. Mm -hmm. But so with base two, right. it still has to be the same thing, but we only have digits be between zero and one. It has one. to be one point, It has right? to be between one and one, so since we know it's going to be there, yep. there's absolutely no reason to be there, like it has to be there. So yep. that's why. It has to be there, and there are exactly 52 bits over here, but since I have the implicit one over here, that makes 53 bits. Yeah. So what I want to do is to take that number, 7.223, which is a base 10 number, and make it use up exactly 53 bits. If it's using too many, we'll make it smaller. Divide, keep dividing it by two. If it's not having enough bits, then we'll shift it to the left-hand side so until eventually it uses up exactly 53 bits, okay? And I have no idea whether, you know, which way I have to shift, so what I'll do is I'm going to use a conditional statement to help me decide which way I need to shift, okay? So the conditional statement, which is in the form of a ternary operator, is to compare this number with um, two to the power of, two to the power of 52, okay? Because I want to map, I want to reach that number, okay? So I want to see if th this number is has to be a conjunction in this case because I need it to be within a certain range. So I will have to use a conjunction here. And the interesting thing about the spreadsheet is when you specify a conjunction, uh, it is in a prefix format. So you don't put and as an operator. It is a, you know, quote unquote function. And then you give it the parameters, exactly. It can take any number of parameters actually. But in this case, we only need two. The first one is, is this number, um, at least as big as 2 to the power of 52, okay? And then the second one is, um, is this number less than 2 to the power of 53? Because we want it to be within that range. If it's within that range, we're good. If it is not within that range, we need to do something about it. Is that okay? All right. So that's the condition of, that's the end. And now we can specify the then. The then is if it is within this range, we are done. If not, we are not done. And we are not done here. It doesn't tell me which way to do the correction, right? So to understand which way to do the correction, I can use the other columns here for this purpose. Um, then I can say, uh, use another conditional statement here. And this one is going to say, do we need to divide it by two, or do we need, need to multiply it by two? Okay. If it is less than, if this number is, okay, I know what to do. I can use nested conditional statement here. So if this number is less than two to the power, th uh, two to the power of fifty-two, then the correction factor is going to be increasing it by one. We want to, you know, shift it, multiply it by two, okay? So I'm just gonna specify the multiplier here. If not, I have to test again, because now I have to say, is this number already more than what we want, okay? Is it greater than or equal to two to the power 53? If that is the case, we want to divide it by two, which means the multiplier is going to be 0.5. Or I can use you know, one versus negative one here. That's just easier. One versus negative one here. And if that is not the case, <coughs> this is the else of the inner ternary operator. If not, I'm actually done, and I can use a correction factor of zero. Okay, so in this case, the correction factor is a one which means I have to multiply that number by two or increase the expo uh, correction exponent by, uh, by one, okay? All right, so knowing this, I'm going to copy this number down here because the next row is gonna be the one with the correction. So the one with the correction is gonna be this number times uh, the power of 
two to this number here so that we are increasing um, the mantissa, we're shifting the mantissa to the left hand side but we have to make the opposite adjustment to the exponent of the power of, of, of the two so this number is going to be this number minus the correction factor from the previous one. Okay, are we still doing okay so far? Okay, because when you look at um, column A, we are doubling, right? When you look at column D, we are subtracting by one, which makes sense, okay? Because if we double uh, the value on one side, we have to uh, subtract one from the exponent in base two. Exactly. So, and then we can also copy these two uh, cells because you know these two are really just for determining are we done yet? If not, how are we correcting the number? Okay, so now I can take this entire row <coughs> and just replicate it until we are done. Okay, and this is the beauty of this one is one is once it's done, it's done because the correction factor is a zero. So I can drag it for as long as I want and it won't change the value at all. So in this case, I only needed to let shift the number once and no, three times, then we're all done. We still do okay? Okay. So in this case, I did lose you know, some bits. I'm not using all the bits you know, to represent this number, but since you know, we are only you know, working on the problem as a subset of the original bigger, much bigger problem, this is okay, okay? Uh, I can take this as an answer. All right. Are there any questions at this point? With everything up to this point? No questions? Okay, so what, what is my number now? My number is this value times 2 to the power of negative 62. Well, better double check again, right? Let's go ahead and double check. So whenever I say, you know, let's double check, I really do not know whether it is okay or not. I mean, I am really double checking myself. I'm not, you know, since this is a value that you guys picked for me, you know, I did not actually know whether, you know, this is the right answer or not. So I'm going to take this number, multiply it to 2 to the power of negative 62 in this case, and I still end up with the same value to begin that I <coughs> began with. So that's good, okay? You really need to double check you know, every time when you're doing it by hand, just to make sure that you did not make a mistake. Because if you make a mistake somewhere in the process and you only do the final check, then you have no idea where you made a mistake. So that's why I'm checking every step along the way and say, okay, is this still correct? Is this still correct? Is this still correct? Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So we are pretty much done. We are pretty much done here because this number if you look at this number as a base 2 number, it is going to use up exactly 53 bits, which means it's going to use up bit 0 to bit 52. But bit 52 is not a part of the fraction because it is this one point here, okay, it is implicit. So that's why you have to do a, do a operation, do an operation to get rid of this particular bit because that bit actually belongs to the exponent, not to the fraction of the main. Okay. Now since we know this bit is a 1, you have at least three ways to get rid of that bit. You can do a bitwise AND with a bit mask. You can do a subtraction. You can also do a bitwise exclusive OR. All of those methods will get rid of this one bit. So it's up to you, okay? Which operator is more comfortable to you, we can use that one. Um, yep. What's the mask? Yeah, a mask, a bit mask, is basically saying, okay, you, you specify, you know, typically you specify um, like a single <coughs> one and then with zeros in both directions. And that's, you know, sometimes we call that a bit mask because you're gonna use it to mask, mask something else. But in this case, you know, we don't want to set something from a zero <coughs> to a one. We want to turn something from a one back to a zero. So this mask is not gonna work, right? And that's why we have to perform a bitwise knot to it first. So what the bitwise knot is going to do is to flip all the zeros into a one, and all the well, okay, ones in, on both sides, and whatever was a one becomes now a zero. Now with this type of bit pattern, if you do a bitwise end with it, 
it will leave every other bit the same as before, but whatever bit is a zero in the mass will now turn into a zero, because anything at zero is zero. What if you just start with the second one? Huh? What if you just start with the second one? Again? You can start with the second one, but it will take you a little bit of time to figure okay. out how to specify it. Okay. Because the first one is easy to specify, because you can just say no. one, yeah. No. Yeah, you can do a one, yeah, left that. shift, you know, uh, X many times, yeah, just, and then do a big rise knot to the whole thing. I, I, I did the second one. Oh, okay. Yeah. The second one, you can't do it. it. It's basically a whole bunch of F with one of the hexadecimal digits not being F. Yeah. But then you have to do all the calculations to figure out here what it is. This one is a lot easier. Yeah, I realized <laughs> that. Yeah, before I started teaching here, I programmed mostly embedded controllers. And with those type of applications, you know, there are a lot of chances or opportunities where I have to use bitwise operators. So bitwise operators is really kind of, to me, it's really familiar. You know, it's as familiar as arithmetic operators. That might explain something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> so as I said, you know, you can do a few things to make make that one extra bit go away. But so I'm gonna do one thing that a spreadsheet can do. A spreadsheet does not have bitwise operators, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to use the subtraction method here. So the subtraction method is just this. All right, so now we have this one here. So this is now the fraction uh, part of the number, okay? All right, we are almost there, but not quite there yet, okay? Because we also need to uh, change the implicit um, exponent in base two. The reason why we have to make adjustment is because the, the value that we have at, at this point doesn't really have the decimal point all the way to the left hand side. Okay, this is where we want it. But the way we have it right now is the implicit binary point is here, not decimal point binary point. It's actually here. Okay, so in order to change it all the way to here, we will have to quote unquote shift it um, exactly 52 times, okay? So, that, but every time we shift it, we have to make an adjustment to the exponent. So we, this one, we, there's no actual shifting to the bit pattern, it's just done to the exponent so that we correct for that factor, okay? So every time you shift it once to uh, the left-hand side, every, every time you shift it to the point to the left-hand side, you are dividing the value by two, if you're dividing the value by two, you have to multiply it by two <coughs> with the correction factor, okay? And for this one, we know exactly how many times we have to correct because it is really just this number, and the number of times you're correcting is exactly 52 times. So that's why, you know, negative 10 is the actual um, exponent in base two that we have to specify. Are we still doing okay? Because this one is is just because you know the point is implicitly here, but we want to make it all the way over here. So we have to make that adjustment. But negative 10 cannot be represented as the exponent because it is always an unsigned number offset by 1023. So the actual bit pattern for the exponent in this case is this number, which is the value that we want to represent, plus 1023, which is the offset. So this becomes the actual exponent of the floating point number. Or the binary bit pattern corresponding to 1013 is going to be a 11 bit number if we put that into bit 52 to bit 62. Bit 63 is strictly a sign bit. If it's a one, the value is negative. If it is a zero, the value is non-negative. Since we're dealing with a non-negative number, we don't have to deal with that. Are we still okay so far? More or less? Okay. <clears throat> so the actual bit pattern is going to be something like this. So the actual bit pattern is going to be this number. <coughs> we want to shift it exactly 52 times. And with a spreadsheet, I do not think it has a bit shift operation. That's okay. We don't need a bit shift operation. We can always say, Multiply it by 2 to the power 52, which is shifting to the left-hand side 52 times, plus this number here, which is accounting for, for bit 0 to bit 51. 
And if you look at this integer and represent it in, in binary, that would be the exact binary representation of a double precision floating point number for the value that we were talking about. Okay, are there any questions about this process? And the other beauty part about, beautiful part about using a spreadsheet is you can ask me about a certain role. You can actually designate and say, I don't understand on this role what we're doing. Yep, go ahead. Uh, number 76 here. 76, yeah. row 76? Yeah. Okay, so row 76 has to do with, okay, row 52 is a 53-bit number. And we know it's exactly 53 bits because we make the adjustments so that it is. Okay. So you basically look at, ah, mm, I need to put this away so I don't try to use it again. Okay. So we are looking at a 53 bit number going from bit zero to bit 52. The first bit or the most significant bit is 52. The least significant bit is, one, is zero. Okay. But we want this particular bit pattern to be representing one point blah, 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 blah. Is that okay? Okay. So, so this one point here is not useful because, you know, um, every value except for zero is starting with one point something when you are dealing with a binary number. So we want to get rid of this bit here. We want to turn it into a zero. So, so it's just, just the masking part then? Yep, exactly. Okay. But instead of masking, which is using a bitwise and operator, yeah. um, a spreadsheet like a, you know any spreadsheet program, most spreadsheet programs do not have bitwise operators. And that's why I have to use a subtraction to okay. do the same thing. And the same thing about you know using the uh, multiplying by the power of two instead of shifting it, because you know, it doesn't have a shift operation. Any other questions? Well, I'm kind of eager to look at this number and see whether it really is representing um, 0 0.001253, okay? So how do we do that? Well, this is all in the spreadsheet. So how do we get something out of a spreadsheet and be able to you know, do all that stuff that we need to do, okay? So we need to gra grab this and well, let me see if this works first, okay? So we do a control C and paste it into here. Okay. Oh, it does work, okay, excellent. Well, except, you know, it has an implicit enter at the end of it, and that's why it says command not found, but that's okay, you know, that, that I can fix. Okay, so we'll go to the 10 folder and we'll say uh, double dot C, and we'll say and We'll do the same trick as you know, usual, okay? So we have a unsigned long long. We we'll call it x. X gets the value that we just got. Semicolon here. Turn zero. That's all we need to do because we're going to use the um, casting of the address and then do the dereference after it is casted. We're, we're going to use that trick. <coughs> and I'm not going to do anything fancy with the compiler, so I'm just going to do it all in one step here. When you only have one single source file, you can do it like this. It doesn't really, because doing it the other way is not going to buy you anything. When you have multiple source files, then using a make file is more appropriate. <coughs> so GDB, I'm hoping nobody is just running the program go like, where's my double precision floating point number? <laughs> yep. What's the height of G stand for? Uh, dash G means include debug information so the GDB can do source level debugging later on. If you do not include a dash G, GDB can still debug the program, but you'll be dropping down to the assembly language right away, which is not the intent of this particular exercise. Okay. Put the break when you main, uh, run the program, single step. This is the only instruction that I need, really need. So now I can say print D, the D reference version of casting the address of x into a double, okay? So this is the moment of truth. Can I handle it? Pretty close. Pretty close. Some values cannot be represented exactly, okay? 
way, so there's no easy way. Now with this one, I think the internal conversion uh, logic will get it closer, okay? Because we can clearly see that you know, it's not as close as we possibly can because of all these zeros here. So we have exactly four bits of zeros at the end of the number. And, uh, and that's because by the time we define the number, the quotient itself is not using up 53 bits and we have to shift it to make it fit into the <coughs> fraction part of the Mantis. Uh, so I was wondering if you could clarify not so much about the actual project but more like what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, someone was saying that uh, so we can't represent a contiguous global values like we basically uh, there, there, are, there are gaps. Yeah, there are gaps. Yeah, like yeah. ints don't have that issue, but floats. That is correct because when you when you think about floating point numbers, most people will think of real numbers, right? But the real number, okay, when you look at um, integers, okay, the, the number line of integers is like there are discrete points, and that's why we call you know, discrete you know math discrete math, right? Because there are actual discrete values where okay, each point here is an actual value, but there's nothing in between. But when you look at real number line, it's continuous. There's always a value between any two non-identical values. So you can pick any two values, okay? And I can say, oh, there's always something in between. You just, you just have to add the first <coughs> to the second divided by two, then you have a new value that is in between those two. And that's why, you know, um, there's an infinite number of values in the real number line, but when you look at a, even a 64-bit double precision floating point number you know, representation, at the most, you can only represent up to two to the power of 64 unique values. But in reality, there's an infinite number of values, so you're always going to, you, you are always going to have gaps. Okay, any other questions? Yep? When we attach our code into the uh, file you gave us and like run the program, will it round the number? We will round the number. Like, uh, like a, when, <coughs> when you convert three, it'll be like 0.29999. Right. right. So when you actually run the main, like the executable, right. it round it? Um, when you print it out, you can ask printf to round it. But the actual value represented is not, may not be the same value as the, the one in the string. Okay. So in this case, you know, in the string, we have 1.252 times 10 to the power of negative three. But when you, but the actual <coughs> representation is not representing this value. It is pretty close, but it's not exact. Yeah. Uh, so, like last time you gave the example of like a three, and that was uh, that ended up being point two nine 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 repeating, right? Or that is 99. correct. But that's three. That's actually point three, right? It is yeah. three times ten to the power of negative one. Oh. Mm -hmm. No, we did negative three. It was like uh, huh? three, three times, like three thousand. Like the three thousand. Yeah. Well, same thing, yeah, like because you know, if you have exactly three, that can be represented exactly. Oh. But when you have point three, then it cannot be represented exactly. Okay, I think I just three. The the bottom line is this: when you look at a binary number, everything in a binary number has to be in how in it's a sum of powers of two. Okay. Yeah. And point three cannot be. It's not a closed form. It cannot just say with a finite number of powers of two and use it to represent, you know, uh, three tenths. And that's why, you know, it's going to be recurring in base two. All right. Any other values? This is one example, so I think we have time for another example. Because I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you were not able to get the program to work entirely, there are certain test cases that did not work with the program. So I want to have another test case just to go through this process again. Negative. Negative one point six seven four to the negative five. One five. Yeah, you can go negative five. Negative five? Yeah. Okay. Well, we can just we'll do negative five actually, because we already had a negative. Hmm? Five. Yeah, just five. five. Positive five? Positive five. Okay, we'll do five. Okay. That's easy. Okay. All right. So the first thing is, you know, this sign here is not going to be very useful. Okay. All we need to do is to set the most significant bit 
of the end result. That takes care of the sign. Okay, there's no two's complement here. Okay, there's absolutely no two's complement when we're dealing with double precision floating point values. Okay, so now it's just you know this part here, and I'm going to use the same trick as before, except you know some of the correction factor will be slightly different. Okay, so what I'll do is I'm going to uh, let's see. I'll do it lazy, the lazy way. Just copy and paste it, right? <laughs> All right. So once again, you know, the numerator is going to be 1674 or 1674. Okay? So instead of 1253, now we have 1674 as a number. And we go through the same process, and it is going to the same point here. Okay? We ended at the same point because. Uh, when you look at one two something versus one six something, they're actually pretty close. Okay, in base two, they're off by not in, in enough for one bit. Okay, are we doing okay so far with that step? But the denominator is different. Okay, because the denominator is not there's no denominator. It's just one itself. Okay, well that's fine. One is done. <laughs> okay, cool. So now we can do the actual division. So the division has to be uh, done a little bit differently because I cannot refer to this value anymore. So A63 has to be corrected to A57. Oh, wait, I have one more thing to, to adjust. I have one more thing to adjust because uh, with this number, um, I also have to adjust for um, the 10,000 here. Yeah, I forgot about the 10,000, sorry. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll adjust for the 10,000, which is just adding five zeros here. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. So the, so the numerator started off with a much larger value, and then the denominator is just zero in this case. Yep. Because you're saying at 1.674, you're shifting it three to the left, which is e to the two, e to, yeah. which is two more zeros. Yeah, five. and it's the same way, yep. Hmm? Yeah, you put five zeros, but you only need two. Oh, I just need two. There we go. Right. Okay, because it's 1.674 times 10 to the power of 5, so that would be the correct one. Yep. There we go. So we're just done earlier, I think. Yep. <coughs> so we're just done earlier. This is A48. Uh, so we will look at the this number. This one is 48 instead of uh, the other one. Okay. The rest should still work, okay, because I, but I'm not done correcting yet, so I have to double check and make sure A48 is here, and it's the first one that's done, so that's good. This is A57, Oops. and it, we are still good. This is actually the uh, double checking, it's still, it's still working, and this is the, uh, the quotient. Okay, well, the so-called quotient, because the divisor is a one, so it's not you know it's not really useful in it in any particular way. Um, we are not done in this case because we still need one more row to get rid of um, the most significant digit. So in this case, we can represent the value exactly because we uh, ended up having too many digits. We are losing digits in order to represent the value. Um, uh, okay, we have to. Oh, I know what. Insert rows. Insert. What? Insert. Insert. <coughs> You're close. Yep. So why didn't you take one? Say again? So why would you need to use one? Like, like, the one? You mean here? Say again? Yes. Because, um, because with this one, I don't need to use um, any denomination denominator to adjust for the value that I'm representing. The other one does, because the other one has uh, e to the power of negative 3. But this one has a positive power. And as a result, I don't need to specify a um, denominator. 
Okay, this number is 1.674 times 10 to the power of 5, right? Do I need to have a, do I need to have a non-1 denominator to, uh, to represent this value using only integers? I don't, right? Because it, it is 1,674, which is an integer, times 10 to the power of 2. So I just need 100 here. This is an integer, this is an integer, but I don't need a denominator. But when I don't need a denominator, it still has a denominator of one. Okay. So it's just the top one. Yeah, that's why I have one as a denominator. When you don't need any actual adjustment from the denominator, you just you just specify a denominator of one. It's up to you to decide how you want to do it. I like to have the same flow in the program as much as possible, and that's why I would just specify a denominator of one so that the rest of the program can flow exactly the same way. But you can branch it off you know, and say this one will handle you know, when the denominator is greater than one, and this will handle when the denominator is just one, or not. there's no need for a denominator. That's up to you to decide. And that's why in this particular homework assignment, I'm not expecting any two submissions that are exactly the same because there's, there's gazillion ways of doing things and even more ways to screw up. <laughs> yep. Uh, I had a two question I forgot to ask. Uh, Go ahead. So, like, let's say you start with zero as the, str uh, the input string. So uh -huh. zero. Should there be a special case? That, like um, the, I'm going to give you a non-zero as the yeah, first digit, so I'm going to say it's at least a one. one. Okay. Yeah. So that will that will make your program a lot easier because you don't have to adjust for that. Yeah. But the logic will still work. This logic will still adjust for that too. Yeah. All right. So getting back to here, um, this is getting the right um, value. Oh, we are we are already doing this. We are still adjusting until it is, says it's done. Okay, come on. All right, finally we are done, okay. So the done part is here, okay. This is the, um, if you look at this number, if you write this number in binary, it will use up exactly 53 bits. It will use up bit zero to bit 52. Once again, we have to get rid of bit 52 itself, we'll do the subtraction, right? Um, so I just have to change the references a little bit here because this one is no longer subtracting from A72, it is now subtracting from A58 to reflect you know, the answer for this particular question. Okay. <coughs> and then the actual exponent is negative 48 plus 52. Um, so when you add negative 48 to 52, Oh, that's because you know, this is also referring to the wrong row, so I have to adjust it to row 78. So now it has a positive 4 of exponent. You add 4 to 1023, it becomes 1027. So 1027 is the actual bit pattern, or 1027 in base 2 is the actual bit pattern that goes into the exponent part of this number. Okay, And then this value here, I think it's still correct because it's this number times uh, 2 to the power of 52, which is shifting to the left-hand side by 52 times, plus this number here, which is the exponent. Um, nope, the other, the other way around, this is the lower portion, this is the high portion. So I think this is still correct. Yep. So if we're adding 1023 to the exponent, shouldn't it be higher than 4? Because that one's 5. It should be bigger than 4, right? No, it does, but the 1023 is the opposite. No, no, he's, he's saying that it should be more than 4. I think you forgot to adjust the exponent. Uh, you know how it stopped at negative 40 something when you shifted? Uh, oh, this the starting point is wrong. Yeah. Ah, you're right. It has to start with uh, this number here. Ah, good job. You guys are good at catching this. There we go. There we go. Now, uh, now it makes more sense. <laughs> Okay, 
is it that value? No, it still doesn't make any sense. Eighty. Well, you forgot to adjust the exponent. So the exponent. Seven fifty-two. No, this one is still fifty-two. Fifty-two is correct. This is just getting rid of that one bit. It's this one that may be wrong. I think there's scroll up. Uh huh. It gets more like the. Alright, it gets done quicker. Like scroll down, like to the point where it's done. Uh, I think you got the negative fifty-three instead of negative forty-six. Forty-six. Oh, okay. This one is referring to the wrong one too. There we go. Okay, so this one starts with the right point, the rest is useless, and this one starts with the right point here, and 17 seems right to me. Yeah. <coughs> well, you can kind of do a quick check because um, 2 to the power of 10 is 1,000, and the value that we are representing is 167400. Zero, zero. So if you take out um, 167400. Zero, zero. So um, 2 to the power of 10 will take care of this part here. The extra part will take uh, 4 additional bits, 4 or 5 here ad additional bits. So you know, when you look at the power of 2, it should be around 15. So 17 is close. <laughs> But we can always double check that, right? So let's let's double check before we go any further. Okay. So when we check, we are basically looking at this number times two to the power of this exponent here, and we still have the right value. So we're good. It's always good to double check. Um, all right. So let me double check everything. So this number is. That number minus that number, so that's good. This is just that number plus 52, so that should be good. This one is just this number plus 10, 23, so that's good. And then this one is just a combination of the bits. So I think we are done here, okay? Let's go back to the program. Uh, no, I don't have to exit. Since I'm already in the program, I can now say set var x equal to, once again, copy and paste. Then I can repeat the previous command and get the result. So, yep. are we to deal with the negative sign for the negative number? Okay, which part is negative? The first of one, the negative of one time x. <coughs> this part here? Yeah. Then you just uh, do a bitwise or, you know, to set the most significant bit. Which is the Huh? Which is the okay, part. let's do it here. Okay, so that would be this number plus 2 power to 63, right? Because it's bit 63 that we have to set. So it will be this number. So copy, go back here, and set x to that particular value. Paste. And then we do the printing. Now it is the negative version of it. That's that, that's that like non-continuous stuff because we should have we shouldn't have really lost. Right? Like, we did lose. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. We should, but we shouldn't have. But that's just a part of the whole thing we were talking about with the floating point. Right. Yeah. yeah. We we lost because of the way we did the conversion. So in Photoshop, when you just did it to put this second more bits. A negative value has a 1 in bit 63. So you have to figure out how to do that. There's a variety of ways to do it. You can do addition, you can do a bitwise OR, you can also do a bitwise exclusive OR if you know that bit was a 0 to begin with. Okay, any questions? This turned out not to taking as much time because we had a spreadsheet already. Okay, but is the spreadsheet helping you to kind of structure your code? Okay, now how do you know which part of your program you know needs what type of control structure? 
Well, let's take a look. When you see something like this from row three all the way to row 48, what is that reminding you of as far as control structure is concerned? Loops? Loops? I don't know. It reminds me of recursion, but I guess loops would do as well. <laughs> Any type of repetition, right? Any type of repetition. Okay. So with a loop, how do you know when you're getting out of the loop? Condition. If there's a condition, right? So uh, I can only see done versus not done here. So in the actual code that you're going to write, how do you know whether you when you when you are going to get out of the loop? The exit condition. You, when you watch the YouTube, you freeze the frame when I enter that equation, and you look at that thing here. Okay, that's one way to do it. And then you look at this equation here and say, but we we are not supposed to use power because it's a floating point, you know, function, and we're not supposed to use that. Well, then what do you do? Create your own, or you can just do shifting, right? The shift operation is the same thing as multiplying by 2. So left shift 1 is times 2. Left shift twice is times 4, and so on. Okay. So that's how you can do all the shifting. Um, but Tech, I have another question here, because C does not have repeat until. Okay. Because this logic only works with repeat until, because you know, I'm specifying the exit condition, not the stay in loop condition. C only has stay in loop condition because it is a while loop. While is the same thing as as long as, right? But you can use not that. Exactly, you can just not that. Yep. There you go. What do you, what do you mean? Negate. So like Negate. Because when you have your repeat until a certain condition, <coughs> it's the same thing as do while not the exit condition. Yep. All right. So I think you guys can. Take it from here. Yes? No? I don't want to see this program again. I'm going to lose the points. I just don't want to touch it ever again. <laughs> I think it is okay now. I think, you know, this is, tell, this is um, in a more or less concise way, it is actually containing the logic of what you need to do. Um, but when you think about what the actual conversion subroutine has to do, like the actual, the real ATOF, it has a much tougher job. Because we only, we're constraining to have what? Four digits up to the decimal point, yeah. and an exponent of in base 10 is up to plus five or down to negative five. Yeah. But in an actual ATOF subroutine, it has to do with the entire range. So how do you deal with that entire range? Let me give you an idea of what your, you know, what the actual subroutine has to do. So what if you have 2 plus 6, 5, 6, 2, 1, 0, 6, 3, 7, times 10 to the power of, I don't know, just give me 50. Yeah. Okay? That's not going to be a 64-bit number. Okay? So what are you going to do? <laughs> well, the actual conversion subroutine actually has a lookup tape. So it has no um, correction factors for certain uh, powers of 10 already. So you start with you know, a, a particular correction factor. So in other words, when we look at this table here, um, you, your starting point is not going to be like this. Okay? Your starting point already has a particular uh, correction factor for the exponent of 2. And you know, that's why they can do it you know, so quickly. Otherwise, you know, this is going to be really tough. If you just think about this, okay? if you just think about having to convert this, into the internal binary, binary representation using just the way we do things is not possible. We cannot do it. Because a number in base 10 that has 50 digits is going to take up you know, at least 50 times 3, which is 150 binary digits. Okay? So it's, not, it's going to overflow a 64-bit number. There's no way we can convert this number using just the method that we have talked about in class. Yep. So do, for like highly sensitive scientific stuff, do mm -hmm. they have like 128 bit systems that would be able to like, so people that have to deal like like physics and stuff, do they have larger? Right, they have that, and then they, in addition to that, they also have local tables. 
So they had lookup tables for you know like certain uh, powers of 10. So they would do that conversion into a correction into two parts where you on one part you have the a power of two and then the other part is a non-power of two that you have to multiply to the rest of the number. And then the other this might get messy, but um, would you like, um, so what I was reading was uh, how there's certain bit patterns, I think it was like for the exponent, all ones and all zeros, uh, for like, man. Not, not, yeah, man, and infinite. Not a number. Yeah, not mm -hmm. a number. Yep. So. Okay. So for that, you can you know, look up uh, the Wikipedia on double precision, okay. double precision floating point <laughs> value. Um, it, it talks about all of that stuff here. You know, so this is actually a pretty good reference documentation. Um, I really do not think the terminology used here is way out of the context of this class. Okay, you know, I think it uses only notations that we kind of should have understood at this point. Um, but when you look at do, 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 exponent encoding, okay, I'll just kind of look up the uh, not a number here. There we go. So the exponent have your know, specific, you know, okay, zero, zero, zero is used to represent a signed zero and subnormals. And the seven FF, you know, turning all ones is used to represent uh, infinity and NAN. And that part depends on you know, whether the fraction, not the, this is not the actual mantissa, this is actually the fraction of the mantissa. So it depends on, you know, the, uh, the value of the mantissa as well. So when you look, when you, when you read this portion, then you can make a table out of this, right? So I'm, I'll, I'll do it for you guys. So I'll take a look at this and make a table. And since we already have a spreadsheet going, might as well just use it. All right. So add a new entry here. All right. So we can make a table and basically say, you know, is the mantissa all zeros? Okay, or the fraction. This is actually the fraction, but since it uses you know, m here, I'm going to use the same way. And then this one is m does not equal to zero. And then over here we have um, the exponent being zero 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 in base sixteen, and we have the exponent being seven ff in base sixteen. So now we have a table of four entries because uh, these are the all the possible combinations. When m is zero and the exponent is zero then the value that we are representing is just assigned zero, which means there really is a positive zero and a negative zero, okay? They're still representing zero, but there are two representations for the value zero. Um, over here, we have the exponent being all zeros, but we have the mantissa being non-zero. So that means it's a subnormal. Then we have this one here, uh, seven FF for the exponent, and the mantissa is zero, so that means it is representing infinity. And then we have here saying it is not a number. There we go. So this is a table of you know, the interpretation, the special cases of interpretation of the value. Okay. Any are there any questions? Questions. All right. So where are you guys at at this point? If you're not done today you know, with your homework assignment, where are you at at this point? A few minutes. Hmm? A few minutes. A few minutes. Okay. Very good. A few minutes from the starting point or the finish line? <laughs> 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 With or without time dilation yeah. effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's parsed. It's parsed. It's parsed. Yeah. Okay. A few minutes compared to the history of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I said here with, with or without time dilation. Your time or my time. <laughs> okay. Anyone else you know, wants to comment where you're at? This for a bit number like that four thousand, but it's a really big number. It would be easier just to convert it into a hex number and then. But converting into a hex representation is already more steps than you need to go through. Because all the operations that I perform in the spreadsheet 
uh, only involves you know bit shifting, comparison, and one single actual division. You know because when you get to the uh, numerator and the denominator, that's the only time when we have to perform an actual division. Everything else is just a loop involving comparison and bit shifting. So the A to F function uh -huh. will just return x for that giant number. That is correct. You are going to return a unsigned long long that is the same as uh, the final form here, which is uh, this one. That one is representing negative um, 1.674 times 10 to the power of 5. <coughs> Any other questions? No other questions? All right. <laughs> How much extra credit do we get if we don't? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about 20%. Okay. Yep. And then your score is going to be based on how many test cases it works with. So I will give you like a number of test cases, and I will write the corresponding code myself to generate you know the actual you know test cases, so that I know you know what would be the actual value represented based on the limitations that we have already put onto this assignment. Any other questions? <laughs> Sorry. So far works with zero test cases. <laughs> it works with zero <laughs> test cases, so you have every reason to use the extra, the extension time. But you're done with the parsing part. Yeah. Okay, so if you're done with the parsing part combined with today's lecture, and I can even upload this spreadsheet if it might be useful yeah, to some of you. That would be incredible. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, but there's so one, one extra addition. Well, uh, it's not extra, <coughs> but I just want to emphasize your C program cannot shell out to LibreOffice. <laughs> <laughs> because I know some of you are pretty smart and say, I know everything there is to know about you know, shelling out <laughs> and make LibreOffice do all the work, get the result back into my program and you know, present it as my own. Yes. So that, you can do that in, in Pro, like system, right? Your system, LibreOffice, a certain spreadsheet. And give it a parameter. Well, not okay. very far along, actually. Yeah, that output is just <laughs> reach out to one zero 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 or something. Oh. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna save this file. What about two days? Um, extending it to Thursday. That's doable. I think it's doable. You know, I think extending it to next Tuesday will only encourage people to procrastinate until next Tuesday, 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll still have to be on this topic, right? Hmm? And we'll still have to be somewhat on this topic, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to extend it all the way to um, Thursday. Okay, so two additional days with this spreadsheet uploaded. Okay, so I'm going <coughs> to call this one double and upload it. And no, I am not going to convert it into Excel format before I upload it. You guys have to figure out how to deal with it. <laughs> And and by the way, I sell LibreOffice install CDs for twenty bucks a piece on eBay. <laughs> it's a yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, donation. Sorry. So, uh, are, are you copy? Are you uploading Excel file or you just copy the screen? I am uploading the Excel file right now. I can sell you open office. Right? <laughs> I can sell you open office, right? <laughs> yes, I can sell it. And an installation for $50? That's yeah. nice. Well, that's nice. That's, 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 that's real nice. I'll throw a DLC for an extra 30 What? You guys are great. That's amazing. I'll even sell you a new OS. Just for you. What? That's great. Thank you. OK, so, so uh, Professor, would you have there? So, like the next, the next unit where I, I thought you were going to ask, you know, do I accept PayPal? <laughs> <laughs> PayPal with fees, yes. Yeah. You're going to have to pay. You're going to eat that, you know, three point five percent too. Yeah. Right, that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> no, but um, 
the non-integer that you said the next you the non-number representation. Uh huh. Does that include? I said that. But he said like assembly, so it's not like two. Like in an arc tangent, I'm like a sort of set of tangent. So I've got everything parts. Tangent, so I'm just going to say it's not going to be a yeah, division by zero you can actually cost an exception. At the end of the day, it's size of the wall. It's not going to be a large store. Then, as a result, you want to be trying to add. So it's point is basically saying, let's just get the one point to start with, and then we have a similar zero point to start with. So that's what you can actually put the set value to the small end, then a portable price is exponential. You have to read this trade. You have to teach it to the best. The next unit. Where it says like non number representation. That's just you know ASCII, Unicode, and graphical data, which is you know RGB. That's RGB representation. There's not much to talk about Thank <laughs> you.